Welcome to The Weekly, a podcast brought to you by Calvary Bible Church. I'm your host, Jay Ewing. I'm on staff on the Erie campus. That's where you can run into me most weeks. Today on the podcast, I have my good friend, Thomas Milburn. We're coming off a win in Little League on Saturday and uh, riding the, the energy high into the next week, right? Absolutely. <laughs> I'll take any win. I, I, yeah, it's been actually a few weeks since we won. It's, we lost four straight. <laughs> yeah. But that was good because right before that, we had won how many straight? Four straight. Four straight. And we're going to the game, and my son Matthew <laughs> says, Daddy, why do we even play these games? We haven't lost any of them. Oh. And I thought, oh, you need to lose, buddy. Yeah, and then yeah. I think that was the week we got smoked. Yep. It was great. That it was so great. good because he went back to the car all sad. <laughs> I was like, yeah, man, welcome to welcome to the reality of life. <laughs> welcome to the reality of baseball. Yeah. Baseball is that. That is. I don't understand how bats get hot and how teams get hot. Like, it, yeah. We're, we're kind of playing the same teams. Yeah, totally. And I have, it just kind of boggles my mind. It boggles my mind. You know, the the MVP of Little League this year is this, the pitching machine. <laughs> <laughs> that that individual oh, is throwing yeah. strikes and getting outs, yeah. Ks, all yeah. over the place. MVP of Little League, the pitching machine. It's good. You're, <laughs> you're a good coach. It's fun, man. Hey, we, we know the chit-chat drives some of you nuts, but... That's why I do this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> they don't so, want. To, hey, listen. They don't want to hear any more about your coffee. Yeah, totally. They don't want to hear any more about the food that you're enjoying. Yeah, totally. They want to hear about what what the Bible says. <laughs> I, I get that, <laughs> but I'm not doing this podcast if that's all we talk about. Okay. Yeah, man. Uh, actually, this week in baseball, go back. <laughs> <laughs> I tried to. Hey, for those of you who are listening, I tried. Yeah, yeah, I tried totally. to move it forward. It's not my fault. Hey, inning five, bases loaded. We're down three to one. And your son taters a ball to center field. And we clear the bases. It was good. It was amazing. It was great that there were base, people on base. Yeah, totally. Were there three runs? On, was it loaded or was it two? Second and third. Second and third. Yeah. It was awesome. It was so good, man. Okay. Calvary, you want to go to calvarybible.com? We just finished up child dedications, and we got Micah six eight coming this weekend. You want to click on your campus, figure out what your campus is doing in the Micah six eight weekend, as well as register your kid for middle school, high school, kids week is all happening this summer. Also, one of the coolest ministries we do around here that we have a lot of cool ministries, but one of the coolest is uh, the wilderness. That's the backpacking ministry. Trips are about to go out. You can see those teams preparing these days around the building. So if you want to get out, you don't need your gear. You don't need gear. We provided that for you. Wilderness, get out into the wild with a bunch of others, and it should be a good time. Do you like backpacking? Love it. Really? Yeah, big fan. Have you gone with your kids yet? No, nah, I have not with my kids. Oh, man. It's, so I started a couple of years ago, mm-hmm. and I mean, they, they already do like the you know car camping. But we we took it the girls backpacking and it was awesome. They did really really well and they just want to keep going. That's awesome. So and he, here's the thing is I actually stole a bunch of stuff from the wilderness ministry. Yes, you did because I didn't want to buy them little kid packs. Yeah, but you know what? They're generous. They they let us use it. So yeah, I took them up. They're looking forward to the summer. That's really we fun. should go. Be an adventure. But I I love backpacking. I've just yeah. never taken my kids to do it. Yet. Yeah, there's a lot of responsibility when you're like laying in a tent with two little children and no other adults. And there's no vehicle to get you out of there. And you're thinking, if I have a heart attack, it's all over. <laughs> <laughs> best of luck, kids. Yeah, best of luck. Yeah, it's like Lord of the Flies. <laughs> it's like every children's book, Hatchet. You know, yeah, that, that's a good book. Although we way. did upgrade to the 21st century. So we, I mean, for a while now, we've camped with like a Spot X. Yeah. So it's like a GPS system that can alert people. So they know how to use that. So if, if dad does have a problem, <laughs> they can be like, call in the chopper. <laughs> call in the chopper. Do you know that if you have your a fishing license in oh, Colorado? Yeah. This is a really good. This is actually really important for the weekly to hear this. Yeah. So you, everyone wants to own a fishing. Everyone should get a fishing license. Yeah. In Colorado. Um, it has, it, it gives you the ability to be, um, it gives you access, I guess, to flight for life. And uh, I don't think that goes on your insurance. I could be wrong about that. That's what I've been told. Yeah. Uh, every year I get my fishing license. 
And I think, gosh, if I have to get flight for life out of here, it's covered. It's covered on oh, my fishing license. You know, this is the year where you're going to, my, my son has been fishing, but not in the sense of like enjoying fishing yet. This is the summer we're going to, we're going to do a lot more fishing. It's good. Yeah. You know, kids have to grow into these things. Oh yeah. I was, I had, I remember when I had all four of mine, like learning how to fish. Yeah. So I had them all and they're you know, doing some spin casting and my youngest says, Hey, I want to, I want a hook on mine. I said, well, why don't you just keep throwing out the bobber with the weights and just practice your casting. He goes, I want a hook. I said, man, I, I, I got three other hooked up over here. You just practice your casting. He's like, why don't I get a hook? I said, just cast. So then he casts and it tags me in the back of the head. <laughs> And I was like, and that's why and you don't get a hook. So let's open up the book of Proverbs here. <laughs> oh, man. But, yeah, when you, when you teach your kid to yeah. fish, it's like, you better bring your tackle box and be ready to just like <laughs> untangle lines and re. Yeah, totally. Oh, yeah, man. man. It's so much fun. Okay, we're, we're in the book of James, like always, right now. Uh, we're about to finish this up. In fact, a few weeks. A few weeks. It's going to be really fun because Memorial Weekend, I'm going to sort of get the cat out of the bag here. All our young guns are going to be preaching on all the campuses. It's going to be great. If the Lord wills. If the, if Lord, the Lord wills. wills. You know, I've seen maybe a dozen people this week so far. <laughs> it's Wednesday. And each one has said to me, like, what their plans were for summer. And like, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. If the Lord wills. <laughs> <laughs> it's so good. You're not, that's sort of and insider. Like, that's you, insider for you right You can't now. just say if the Lord wills is like the right ULR address. <laughs> you know, it's like. It's not the magic phrase you say to make it come true. It's true, but to you, it's we're going to tell Thomas if the Lord wills. If, if the Lord wills, yeah. Anyway, but um, yeah, it's going to be really fun to have those guys close out the series in a few weeks. Yep, they're already training, preparing. I uh, met with one of them this morning. They're excited. I'm excited for them. Yeah, I think that one of the things I love about Calvary is two like kind of you know unspoken values, mm-hmm. which is the multiplicity of voices. Yep. So we don't build a campus on one personality, on one voice. Mm-hmm. Um, and then the desire for like young mm-hmm. preachers to have exposure and reps because we want to we want to develop young preachers. Yeah. I love it. So it's gonna be more really voices cool. than just one, and young voices are really helpful. You know, I love that when I go to calvarybible.com, I don't see your face on it. Me too. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't see Tom's face. You know, like, it's, it's not... Tom Shirk, dot org, you know, that Calvary's at. Yeah. I if it was that. dot org, you'd never find us. <laughs> dot com. <laughs> dot com. If it was yeah. thomasmilburn.com and there was a picture of Kristen in you. I'd leave the church. We would be in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We would be in trouble. Yeah. It, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And that's not a dig on if you go to that church, but that's a dig on if you go to that <laughs> church. <laughs> All right, so, man, yeah, I would just say there's just some people that are really popular, man, and they're like really, they're yeah. really, really good. Totally, man. And I know we just aren't. <laughs> we just, we just aren't. Yeah. So we made a joke. I just made a little insider joke about the Lord will, because we were just in there and James chapter four thirteen through seventeen. Some of the other campus dipped down into uh, the verses before that, but you stayed in a little section here. And I was super appreciative because there's, and James, sometimes we're rushing it. That makes sense? Yeah. I just feel like we're, I was like, well, how about I just preach on that sentence this week? You know, and that's sometimes valuable. But it feels fast. I think the other speakers did a nice job. They started up in verse yeah. 11 and just captured the same, similar themes, which is pride. Mm-hmm. So 11 through 13 is the prideful person who puts themselves as the judge. Mm -hmm. So they're the ones who think of themselves as the authority over the law Mm -hmm. and why that's wrong. And then the passage we looked at in Erie 13 through 17 is those who are prideful and put themselves as though they're authority over time or outcome. So both have to do with the fact that James is calling us humble yourselves before the Lord. Um, Don't be prideful. Don't be the judge and don't be the one that's like the, the ultimate director or captain of your life. Yeah. If you really want to listen to something about James 13 through 17, that'll just bless your soul. You need to pause the weekly and go find Tom's message. It's at Tom Shirk ministries.com. <laughs> <laughs> but his bolder message was 
It's like, buckle up. Here it is. It was so good. good. Yeah. Okay, so one of the things that sticks out to me the most, and I think I failed you. I publicly have to say, I didn't get the I know, humidifier. I know. I know. You didn't. You didn't tell me. I, you were busy, and I didn't. I, I didn't think of it till Friday, and I was like, Nah, Jay doesn't. Jay doesn't no, want to text. No, no, I want to text. Yeah, I, I was sitting on Sunday morning at ten fifty when he got up. I was like, I think I was supposed to get humidifier. <laughs> yeah, it's all good. It's all good. <sighs> I didn't want to say anything, but I failed you. He didn't fail. I did fail you. Nope. We, no. Okay, so it says that you are a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. How interesting is that metaphor? I, I think it's a biblical metaphor, right? Yeah. So how many times has the scriptures spoken about that before? Like just the, the brevity and the frailty of life. I mean, this is, this is so... Um, you just hear Ecclesiastes in this. Yeah. You know, like, goodness gracious, life just seems empty and vain, like how quickly we appear on the scene, struggle and toil for everything, and then we disappear. And who benefits from our toil? Like why are we working so hard? Yeah. Um, I think we looked at the, you know, words of Moses, where Moses has been, Lord, just teach us to be wise and number our days. Like help us to know how short this thing is and not be trying to get overwhelmed and try to control everything, but trust you in it. Mm. So a mist. A mist. What comes to your mind immediately when you think of the word mist, vapor, or smoke? I mean, you could kind of interchange all three of those. Yeah, yeah. I am. So your life is. I, I really do think of. I do think of a humidifier because my son has, you know, childhood asthma. Certain times of the year, the humidifier has to be in his room, you know, just for his health. Yeah, and he loves cranking that thing up and draining all the water out <laughs> as fast as he can because it's so cool. It's such a cool thing, right? They like. How does that even work? I don't even know how that really works. But out of that little pipe comes this beautiful white smoke that just comes. It's heavy. It's dense. And then it's just gone yeah. instantly. And so, you know what I actually think when I think of this now? I I ran into First Peter 1 years ago. Yeah. And that really changed my sort of outlook. Is First Peter says that the word of God does not fade away. And I think that's more incredible is that my I do fade away, but the word of God doesn't fade away. Nothing which I have received in the word of God will ever fade away. There are a few things that are eternal, right? Or yeah. Word of God being one of them. Yep. So if you're gonna spend some time around God's word, you're thinking this is going to be forever. Yeah, it's a it's it's an eternal investment if you get up and read your Bible. Yeah. It's that day, whatever you read is an eternal investment. Eternal. That's, That's a long time. Yeah. So what else, what other things are eternal? Uh, God. God, yep. Like we are, like God, not that we have always existed, but that we will exist. That God has pressed, impressed eternity into our hearts, like we're stamped with it. Right. So we're going to, we're going to live beyond these days. Yeah. And I see death as one closing your eyes and one just waking up again. Yeah. Like a blink. So if we are, that means other people are. Yeah. So that means in some degree... Like our children are one of the eternal things that we get to to participate in. Yeah, yeah, it, that's very true. The human sort of journey is what we get to participate in. That. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But but it's not very eternal. few other things, right? I get the relationship. I guess isn't. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what James is, you know, he's he's combating these people that are thinking, I'm just gonna, you know, get me my stuff. Mm-hmm. I'm gonna do this as as well as possible. I'm gonna go on this day to this place for this long and earn this much money. And he says, you haven't even accounted for the God who gave you breath in your lungs, who gave you the mind to have plans, that gave you the physical abilities to carry them out. You haven't even accounted for him as though you are the ultimate authority over time, of, how, of, of duration, of location, and, I mean, the audacity to say, and this will be the result. Yeah, totally. No That's doubt. a very prideful person. No doubt. But this, this, was, this was really illustrated years ago. I'll tell a quick story here. I lived in Longmont. Um, and I met the richest man in Longmont history. The his, richest man in Longmont history. Yeah, yeah. Stu Golden is his, was his name. We don't have to name names, but if we're going to name yeah, names. No, no, no. Stu Golden. Stu Golden. Yep. And he's still Golden Ponds. Like his, he inherited a concrete business. Okay. And turned it into just, you know. But he was a believer. And uh, Stu, I ran into Stu later in his life. 
um, you know, Stu had it all. He had the big house. He actually had the house on the Longmont Airport. He had a private pilot go anywhere in the world anytime he wanted to. Crazy, right? Just but he was also a believer. And um he was a great believer. He would actually play the organ every Sunday at church. Mm. He grew up he his his love was the organ. So isn't it all of yeah, ours? Yeah. So old you know, the old folk service, he was playing the organ, the hymn service type thing. And um he passed away. And lots of people came to his funeral. Like CSU president came, you know, like just influential people. Mm-hmm. And you know what none of them talked about? His money mm. or his things. You know what they talked about was how they felt around Stu and how Stu pointed to Jesus. That's good. And I was a young gun then, you know, and that was super impressionable upon me that here I was, th- this dude was in our midst, had passed away, and no one cared. For his money. Yeah. How incredible I, is that? I mean, wouldn't that be just the aim of our life to say, I want to be so impressed with Jesus yeah. that my life impresses Jesus on other people? No doubt. That's called image bearers. That's a biblical. That's, that's biblical language. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, otherwise we're so impressed with something else, someone else, mm, somewhere yeah. else. Somewhere else. We're always thinking of what's next yeah. in order for that. So I think the posture then I think that James is providing is a desire to actually first and foremost put the Lord's will ahead of our own. Yeah, and you highlighted that in a great way. I think sort of explain why you were like, if I could have one thing, you said something like this, like that you would love God's will. Yeah, I think, well, here was the question that we asked. Yeah. Because in the text, you know, there's a, you know, we will go and do this for this many days where we'll do it and make a profit. I don't even think that James was, I mean, we know that James wasn't condemning having a plan, making a plan, Mm -hmm. wanting to execute a plan, even have the success of a plan. What he was challenging these folks with is your plan should be subservient to the Lord's plan for your life. Mm -hmm. Like you would, you'd want to put the Lord's will before. Mm -hmm. And I just asked the question, okay, if you get a whole year, like we said, 2023, yeah. So if you're listening to this in the year is 2027, I'm not sure how 2023 went for you. But. <laughs> and I don't know if I'm still around. <laughs> <laughs> the Lord will. Um, but if you could have a whole year and you either got to live it and accomplish everything according to your will. So just think about everything you really want, when you want it, where you want it, how you want it. And you got to map out the entire year and say, everything that I will, will be accomplished. Mm-hmm. Or you get to say in this year, I'm going to have everything that God wants for me. So I'm going to let God will what I get, when I get it, where I get it, how I get it. Whose will would you want to experience? And I think just subconsciously, yeah, there's a lot of people in the room because my gut instantly says, well, I'd, I'd like my will. Like I'd love 2023 to be the execution of my will perfectly. Totally. And there's just not a love and desire for God's will. Mm -hmm. Because for some reason, we think if God got everything he wanted from us, out of us, with us, for us, we would be on the losing end of that. And that's where I want to sit. Do you think we have a hard time? Do you think we can't answer that the right way or the perceive right way because we don't actually think God loves us. I th- I think it's the it's the condition we talked about from the beginning with Adam and Eve is there is a voice that says God's will for you to not eat, to abstain from, to enjoy over here is holding out on you. Gosh, man. And so it's like I want to create an appetite within myself and within a congregation that says More than my own will. I don't even want to just say, okay, let's put, if the Lord wills, before my will. I want to say, if the Lord wills, and please, Lord, let your will override my will. Mm -hmm. Let it direct my will. Let it shape my will. Let it, like, create new desires in me. Like, would you crush my will Mm -hmm. in some capacity? Because I want what you want. And 
I think the point of of Jesus when the disciples ask Jesus, like, teach us how to pray. Yeah. And he says, okay, well, you know, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And what makes heaven heaven is God's will is done perfectly mm-hmm. without hindrance, right? There's no sin. And it's like, well, if you don't want God's will done perfectly as he so chooses in your life now, like you you are not going to want to go to heaven because that's what hev- that's what makes heaven heaven. Yeah. Is the will of God is perfectly carried out in love and goodness. Like you just get to just live in that grace forever. So his will is eternal. Yeah. And what I mean, I don't know. What a mystery it is to have God's will being executed at the same time that he permits us to live our wills mm. in disobedience, you know? Yeah, that's a wrestle with that as a human, huh? Because, you know, the, the, the danger of a text like this is just to kind of have this fatalism of, well, I guess God will just do whatever he wants. Like, why even, why even insert myself or have preferences or desires? Like, there are faith systems that say you should just eradicate your desires and preferences and really love nothing and want nothing. Mm-hmm. And that's not what this is saying at all. I think it's what you want more than anything is if the Father wills. And there's just a place in my own life, and I know this is really hard because I have a lot of tragedy in my own life, like just hardship, wickedness, injustice. And seeing what God has done through that, I think is his incredible goodness, right? He can pull goodness out of just wreckage. Yep, he can. But I think even after Sunday, like so many people came and just shared their own story of how God brought about his will for something in their life and how they're eternally grateful for it. Mm-hmm. And they never saw it coming. And they're just like, that was so much bigger and, and different, more life-giving than I would have even thought for myself. Mm-hmm. And so I think I'm just trying in my own life to have the natural response to everything that happens is, all right, that's God's goodness going to show up in my life somewhere. Even in the really, really hard stuff. Yeah. I don't understand. I, I loved, there was a dad that he had lost his son and, he said, how are you doing today? And his response was, you know, I know I know, God is good. I just can't see it today. And I thought, that's, that's an honest, hey, what I'm experiencing is like so much pain and sorrow. I don't see goodness, but I know goodness. Mm-hmm. And so I'm just trusting the Lord and trusting what he's got for me, even if this is a really painful day. Yeah. Painful year, pain, painful rest of my life. Yeah. So how do you get an appetite for God's will? How do you grow appetite? Is, are there things that we can do that grow that appetite? I was talking to a gal this week who knew that she had done a few things that were not pleasing to the Lord. And it was kind. She just came up to me and said, hey, this, is, this is not what I want to do, and I did it again. What do I do? Um, I said, you know what? I think you need to taste God's will. Like I think there's so much in the Psalms of taste and see, right, that he is good. Um, he said, experience, yeah, experience it. Yeah. Right. Experience God. So you got to throw it out there and say, okay, I see that this is where my desires and my heart want to go, but I'm going to do, what I know the Lord wants me to do. I'm going to tell the truth this time. I'm going to ask for forgiveness. I'm going to be generous when I don't want to be generous. I'm going to, you know, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm going to stay faithful. I'm going to, you know, just give a thousand examples. And then you have to experience that working out Mm -hmm. and say, oh, this was this was really good, but what's what's some uh, something else that we could do to get our appetites in view of God's will? Yeah, I mean, you and I, you know, I think do this together in relationship. There's this sharing the stories of how God's working in your life, my life, other people's lives, and so even on Sunday and this week when people were sharing their own story, it's like, man, that's encouraging. It gives yeah. me encouragement to say, oh, I I want that in my life. Mm-hmm. And it's not, I mean, it's not easy. Like going even back to my buddy who lost his son, like it's not as though you just chalk up and say, well, God willed every single thing and all these tragedies. He gave me cancer. He brought this. I I mean, he's asking us to pray Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven because it's not happening on earth, Mm -hmm. right? I mean, Jesus stands out of Jerusalem and he just cries like, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how long I've wanted to gather you. Like that's his will. I want to gather you in. Like a mother gathers her chicks, but you weren't willing. Like there's there's this tension of wills, right? Like Jesus wants to gather his people in like a mother would gather her children, mm-hmm. and they're not willing. And so I think there is a sense of, okay, share, share stories with me. Like how did God show up in your life? 
so that I have an appetite and an interest to let him continue to have his way and show up in mine. What about you? Are there things that's really good that are in your mind? No, I I think you're We have you're, left the script. Yeah, we're great. This is this is the script. Um you know, I think praying the Lord's Prayer will actually help you in this process. So I would say appetite for praying the Lord's Prayer. Pray it once a day, pray it twice a day, pray it three times a day, pray it ten times a day. Um, schedule it. Put it on your iPhone, put it on your wristwatch, whatever it takes to ding, go, okay, let me pray the Lord's Prayer. Pause and pray. I think that's important. Um, reading God's word and seeing his will accomplished is super encouraging. And I say this in story form. So sometimes, you know, I fall in this trap where I'm like reading as a functional, to like functionally get something from it or study from it or mine it for something, which is always good. You should do that occasionally. But also sitting back and relaxing into the narrative of it and watching like, I was just thinking of Joseph and his son's story in Egypt. Like, just watch it. How does God's will happen? What it happens because of it? What is the result of it? Um, we we get to witness so much of God will, even in our Bible, that we should just relax into it and read it for reading its sake and enjoying it. And um, I think that's very important for an appetite of God's will, too. Because you see that he's up to something, that there's something sovereign, that there's something broken, that he's doing it. And I think that's really enjoyable and encourages me. Um, You know, that's why I think the spiritual disciplines, we talk about this occasionally. I think the classic spiritual disciplines of worship, reading, serving, evangelism, fasting, praying, those are designed to help you not only encounter God, but also to help yourself get into God's will. So do those things as well. That's good. Yeah. I wonder if for for a lot of us, when we hear God's will, we have something very specific that we're thinking of when it pertains to our life. Like, who does he want me to marry, or where do I go right. to school, or what car does he want me to buy, or should I take that job or this job? And for us, like, the idea of God's will seems super ambiguous. Mm-hmm. What would you say to somebody as they're wrestling with this idea even of like, okay, if the Lord wills, great. How do I know what he wills? Well, you can go to Bible Gateway and just type in God's will and you'll find the Bible passages. I think Tom did a great job of talking about God's will and his message. Um, there's some couple of things. One is like, don't be drunk on wine. This is the will of God to be drunk on the Holy Spirit. What does that mean? Uh, to abstain from sexual immorality is God's will. That's a pretty big one. I mean, if you were going to work on those two, those are two first ones you should <laughs> work on. <laughs> it is. I, I always think it's fascinating that we get hung up on the particulars of our decision making when probably 90 plus, I don't know what the percentage would actually be, of how I live as like a human being, as a man, as a husband. Mm-hmm. Uh, you live as a, a wife or a friend, um, a community member, all that. Like the majority of how we operate day to day is already revealed in Scripture yeah. of how we live out the will of God. No doubt. I think, yeah. And so just dive into that and then let the particulars be the particulars. I mean, if you, if you develop a listening, if you, if you tune your ear to listening to God's voice, like you know his voice because you're in his word or you're around his people, then I think the other things will come together more easily. And he might, you might just hear him say, man, both are really good options. You should choose, and I'll be with you either way. Yeah. You know? My sheep know my voice, Jesus said. I love that. You know, you think about being on the hills of Palestine as a shepherd, and you're a sheep, and you hear that voice. That's a voice of comfort, right? Mm-hmm. A voice of that you want, you know that a good shepherd is actually protecting me molding me, shaping me, protecting me from wolves and evil. That would be a good question, I think, to have self-reflection on, is when you hear the will of God being done in your life, does that encourage you or does that scare you? All right, we're going to leave it there. You heard it first, Calvary. That's a great question, Thomas. So when you hear about the will of God in your life, 
Does that encourage you or scare you? All right, Calvary, we love you. Have a great week. Look forward to connecting on the weekend. Peace out.